Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Data Science Hangout. I'm Rachel, and I lead customer marketing at Posit. Uh, Posit is the open source data science company building tools for the individual team and enterprise. I just started adding that because I noticed some people actually found out about the Hangout without knowing about Posit yet. Um, but thank you so much for hanging out with us today. The Hangout is our open space to hear what's going on in the world of data across different industries and to connect with others facing similar things as you. Uh, we get together here every Thursday at the same time, same place. So if you're watching this as a recording in the future and you want to join us live, there'll be details to add it to your calendar below. Um, I have a really fun announcement today. Uh, you may have seen on my LinkedIn already, but I'm thrilled to make it official and have Libby here in joining me as my partner at the Hangouts. And so Libby and I first met at a data science Hangout, I think back in July 2021. So like one of the very first ones. Uh, and I can't believe it has been that long. And I know many of you already know Libby very well <laughs> from the Hangouts and beyond. But Libby, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself to I would love to um I'm Libby and yes I Rachel and hasn't been able to get rid of me for three years so she just said like we'll just invite her in um <laughs> I am a, a data science freelancer right now I really really enjoy teaching and mentoring and that is what I get to do and I'm also starting as a posit academy mentor um my first cohorts will be next month so I really, really love this community and really hope that we can do cool, new, fun stuff. Happy to be here. Um, me personally, I, um, I'm a big maker and a big reader. I made this shirt. I actually dyed this fabric myself and sewed this shirt. So you'll see me wearing lots of me made clothing. But yeah, happy I'm to be so, here. so excited to have you here, Libby. I know I mentioned before you've always felt like a co-host, <laughs> but making it official makes me really, really excited. Um, I know other people love connecting with each other in the chat, so I always like to add this reminder here. If you do want to connect with others, I encourage you to say hi in the chat and introduce yourself, maybe your role or where you're based, something you do for fun, or if you want to share your LinkedIn so you can find each other after. Um, but to continue just my very quick <laughs> intro here, we're all dedicated to keeping this the friendly and welcoming space that you all have made it over the years. And we love to hear from you no matter your years of experience, titles, industry, or languages that you work in. It's 100% okay if you just wanna listen in today, although we love getting to hear from you live. So you could raise your hand on Zoom to ask questions and I'll call on you to jump in. You can put questions in the Zoom chat and just put a little asterisk next to it if it's something you want me to read instead. Otherwise, I'll call on you to jump in. And then third, we do have a Slido link where you can ask questions anonymously too. Um, so with all that, thank you for spending time with us today. I'm so excited to be joined by my co-host, Jason Foster, Director at Marathon Asset Management. And Jason, do you want to kick us off with introducing yourself and sharing a sure. little bit about your role? Yeah, no, thanks uh, for having me today. I've been uh, an avid listener uh, for most of the data science hangouts uh, this year. I think really what piqued my interest was the Wes McKinney interview, I think back in March of this year, given his Python background, and that's primarily what I use uh, professionally. So definitely, um, you know, motivated me to join these. I've learned a lot from everyone you've hosted so far. So thanks uh, for putting this on. And you know, hopefully other people in finance want to join going forward and want to share their journeys and how they're approaching quantitative finance, data science, Python, et cetera, and R2. Um, always interested in uh, what other people are doing as well. So, you know, thanks again. And, and thanks everyone for being here today. I know uh, maybe some of you are still recovering from the PositConf hangover. Uh, so appreciate uh, everyone taking some time out of their day uh, today to join us. Uh, but a quick quick intro about myself. Um, I'll go back actually to the very beginning. Um, I actually did not live, I was not born uh, in the US. I was born overseas, lived overseas uh, for until I was about 10 years old uh, and then came to the US. 
uh, there. And what's interesting after that is I actually went to high school uh, in Alaska, that's where I graduated from, and I wanted to be close to home and I liked math and I wanted to do something in the business world. And the closest big city uh, to Alaska is Seattle. And unfortunately, I didn't go to Positconf, but I wish I did. But that's where I did my undergrad uh, in uh, math and finance uh, there. And actually, the moment that I hit the ground in Seattle, my, my family moved uh, to the Middle East, back overseas. So I turned from a short flight to a pretty long flight again to go visit them, visit home. Um, I can talk about that too later. Uh, so I did math and finance uh, in undergrad. And then I was fortunate enough to have a few different internships. And one of them was at an asset manager uh, in Seattle um, on the quantitative research team. And this was uh, back in 2009. And I was uh, lucky enough to sit next to a local university professor in statistics. I, he was more like a consultant and you know, really gave our team the theoretical academic boost uh, that we needed. And I was able to learn a lot from them, including R and R package development. We had an internal R package uh, library that we could use. So I was learning a lot about finance and R and programming uh, stats uh, from the team. And I really was motivated to learn more. And um, after that, I did so. And I went to grad school and I got a master's in financial engineering. Um, and I think one interesting thing is this was a while ago and it's so similar to Data, what data science would be now maybe in finance and math if you just applied it in that space to finance. Uh, but back then it was called financial engineering, uh, financial math, computational finance, uh, any one of those really is all the same. Uh, there are some differences, but for the most part, similar. Um, and so I did grad school uh, in New York and I was fortunate enough to get an offer from the same firm uh, in New York to join the risk and quantitative analysis team uh, there too and as a risk manager primarily, and I can talk about that more uh, later, but you know, covering different types of portfolios and investments and working with different types of portfolio managers, um, multi-asset, fixed income, et cetera. I can talk about that later too and some uh, examples of how I used R and Python. Um, and you know, I, I, then in 2016, 2017, I went presented a couple of times at R and Finance on an R package that I've developed, and it's available on CRAN. Uh, it's called uh, Roll, and it's just doing basic rolling statistics, but super fast. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that I've made it fast over the years, and I can talk about that too, and some of the people that I've interacted uh, with over the years and some of the feedback I've gotten and the lessons learned. Uh, it's interesting to have a, a package uh, available on CRAN for everyone to use. Um, and then I've done a few presentations on it over the years. And then our firm made a pretty uh, strategic shift uh, to Python. Um, and so we switched uh, professionally a lot of my work over to Python and so did everyone else at the firm. And one of the more interesting projects that I led towards the end of my previous employer was on um, a term I've heard a few times uh, here too is on citizen developers. And that's when you have a people, bunch of people that aren't technically employed to do professional software engineering, creating uh, packages or libraries for their day-to-day -day job just to make their lives a lot easier. Uh, and that's, that's challenging in itself, um, motivate people whose job it is to do something they're not supposed to be doing, but it helps them. So you have to find some time uh, to convince people to spend time on that uh, for them and for others. So it's interesting dynamic, um, and that was all in Python. Um, and then more recently, you know, I, I wanted to kind of get my hands a lot more dirty again and, you know, have uh, some more impact on some of my quant skills and apply them and do more programming and quantitative work. So I've joined about a year ago, a smaller asset manager, still not, super, not small at all, but smaller. Um, and, you know, I've been able to use what I've learned um, in terms of scaling processes from the risk management perspective, quantitative framework uh, to, you know, other types of portfolios and uh, portfolio risks uh, specifically uh, there now too. So uh, I tried to cover a lot of ground. I've hopefully thrown out a bunch of different angles we could go. Um, you can uh, leave it there and open up for questions or if there's anything else you want to add or I can add Rachel and Abby too as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing I forgot to ask you is what do you also like to do outside of work yeah. for fun? Right. Um, so actually every day um, I have two boys now and the only free time I have is super early in the morning. Uh, so I go running. I have to go running every day. It just doesn't feel the same if I don't go running. Uh, so that's something I do every day. And what's interesting about that is I think part of me also doesn't like running very much because I like to run really fast. I think it's part of me just wants to get over with. So I've never run, never raced more than a 10K, but uh, still pretty good times uh, for everything up until that point too. So that, that's something I like to, that kind of keeps me sane, keeps me going every day. Nice. I learned there's a pretty big running community here at Posit yeah. at the conference. People were getting up early to go for, for runs. <laughs> yeah, there's um, way more hills so than I know, people expect. Yeah. <laughs> I know um, a lot of us might not be from a, a finance background, um, and you can't give us any investment advice here. But um, I was just wondering, when you talk about risk management, could you just share a little bit with us on, on what that means? Sure. Um so the, the way to think about it is maybe from the other side of the table, which is the portfolio manager side, and you think about the investments that they want to make and the style that they have, um, and how are they going to put um, you know, risk on the table or money in terms of investments to stocks or to bonds, and then how do you under how do you kind of quantify the various outcomes of uh, those those exposures, those risks? Uh, those bets that they're taking um, in the same way that they would take it. And, you know, you want to be able to explain to them the risk that they're taking in the same way that they take risk. You know, two different teams, uh, you know, might have different approaches, and I'm not going to want to use the same language or um, presentation of how they're taking risks. Um, I'm going to want to tailor it uh, specifically there, too. So just to maybe a really high-level example is, Let's say you, you really like this, a stock, um, pick your favorite technology company that's based in the US. And just by saying those few terms, you can start thinking about different exposures that a company like that might have, You know, just general market exposure, just general equity market exposure. And then they're gonna also have some US equity market exposure. They're gonna have some technology exposure. So those are three pretty high level risks already. And then you have to figure out how much exposure or weight do they have to each of those. Um, and then you can start thinking about, okay, what happens in this scenario if that happens, if you know technology um, you know continues or doesn't in its current uh, trend. Um, and then you can start having those conversations uh, with a portfolio manager and ask questions along the lines of does uh, you know does this surprise you? Is this what you'd expect? Um, and it's more of a two-way dialogue. And it can get kind of fun in a way because, Especially when you have events coming up like elections, you can start thinking about who's going to, you know, what kind of impact will each candidate have uh, in, in terms of their policies and start thinking about, okay, what are, what are they going to do here or there? And then what's my exposure uh, to, to that uh, factor? And then I can start thinking about, you know, how is that going to impact what I'm actually holding and have very similar conversations again uh, with the portfolio manager. So, Thinking about the exposures to different, you know, factor bets is what I've essentially been describing in a way. But at the end of the day, there's also a bunch of non-factor, more idiosyncratic, stock specific or asset class specific uh, risks are, are, that are unique to that company as well. But you know, for the most part, uh, what I've been describing is more on that factor-based uh, side, and you can start to think about those uh, in the larger context of the markets and explaining those and. Uh, thinking about that as a two-way uh, street with the portfolio manager. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Libby, do you want to ask enough, the next one? <laughs> sure. Maybe I do like real-time onboarding and figuring out <laughs> coaching together. I, I was just going <laughs> to say, we're going to have to figure out our dynamic eventually. Um, sure. So we have a question from Bill with asterisk, so I will ask it. And it is, what were the pluses and minuses, sort of a comparison of moving from R to Python, like were you dragged into this transition or were you okay with it and on board? How did it go? Sure. No, that's a great question. And, um, you know, that's an interesting question because I, I professionally do a lot mostly in Python programming, but I still have this R package uh, that I'm maintaining. So, you know, kind of 
personally on the side, nights and weekends, chipping away uh, at that package uh, as well. And I, I think, I think, to you know, I think to be honest, a lot of what what I'm doing is getting questions uh, from the portfolio management team or other teams, and we ideally want to be able to use the systems that we have in place um, to answer their question. Uh, and and to be honest, they just have a question they want to answer. They don't necessarily need to know how you're coming up or which tools you're using to answer that question. It's more fast paced in that sense. So. Really, whatever it is uh, that gets the job done the fastest is really all that matters. Um, but if it, you know, if the system can't handle it, you have, you're on your own, and that's really where the quantitative skills come into play. And you know, R and Python, in my opinion, are so similar. You know, I've heard it mentioned a few times that maybe there's the whole tension because they are so similar, and people can uh, are comparing them because of that. Uh, if they were so different or special from each other, then they wouldn't have those conversations. Uh, it'd be obvious uh, which way to go, but it's maybe not, and that's why. Um, so in my mind, I think there's they're so similar. There's really not much uh, differentiation, and I've been a pretty big uh, adopter myself of doing a lot of stats uh, in R or in uh, Python, uh, and then doing a lot of the graphing um, in in uh, in R with ggplot as well. So I've been I've been a pretty big adopter of um, you know the Quarto framework uh, more recently. Um, and I've been using RStudio for a very long time. Actually, I remember uh, hearing about it at, way back in 2011 when it was presented at R and Finance. So, you know, it's it's been good to see it evolve over the years to really support the two languages, R and Python, um, especially. And then Positron uh, this year has been, you know, nice nice to see as well, and excited for what uh, comes comes there as well. Um, but regardless, you know, if your whole firm switches over to, to Python, um, you know, for me personally, it was not hard. Uh, I could, I, like I said, I think R and Python are so easy to, in terms of uh, transitioning um, and answering very similar questions uh, with both. And you, you have to keep in mind, though, what one thing is who is going to support the system in place at your firm. So if all of the you know the the technology teams uh, know Python or and they don't know R, uh, and you want to ask them an R question, it's going to be very challenging to get much uh, out of them uh, or support or you know traction on your problem that you're facing. And really, if you're trying to get your job done, you want to just do what is uh, maybe easier uh, and more seamless uh, to do. And that's one of the you know, selling points of switching to something that's well supported within your uh, firm, whether it's R or R and Python, as well. So you you know you go to both, you but you also want to be able to have impact on your job, and you know you want to get the job done. And uh, if your whole uh, technology team knows Python, then it's a lot easier to um, speak the same language and to really have that support uh, from them as well. And it's not so much of an uphill battle to get. Uh, what what you might need uh, out of them, or to do your your job within the day. So hopefully that that answers your question. It's um, you know it's definitely a good one, and I think just I, I think for me personally, it goes back to moving around a lot as a kid and just being in different environments. You just kind of have to adapt and you know uh, try to you know be use use what's what's in your environment as, to the to uh, to your benefit as much as possible. Thank you. Um, Mauro, I see you asked a question in the chat. Do you want to jump in here next? Yeah, sure. Jason, thanks a lot. I wonder, uh, you seem to be very well versed in code-based tools and very happy to adopt them. But uh, I wonder if the same was true for your team or if you had to kind of help them uh, turn from something that is not code-based to tools that are code-based. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Uh, one, one interesting observation was, um, there were I've seen I saw a lot of people jump from VBA directly into Python, less so from uh, R into Python, which was interesting. And some people switching from MATLAB into Python, and a bunch of folks just skipping the whole uh, R uh, element uh, entirely, which was interesting to me. Um, and you know, in terms of training, one thing that I did um, initially was set up some exercises uh, for people. Uh, so putting together, uh, you know, you want to use formats that are similar to what people would use internally. So, you know, creating a 
PowerPoint deck that is going through exercises that you would normally need to do for your day job uh, and asking questions along the way. So for example, you know, in the risk world, you can think of like we, in terms of risk, a lot of people would think about volatility and standard deviations. So if you wanted to calculate a standard deviation of a return series, how would you do that in Python and going through like the simple example there? And then your firm might have some custom tweaks to how they calculate that. So how would you do that? And how would you maybe tap into these APIs that you would use internally and feeling, and you think of it like, um, you know, you're asking a question and you have some questions and you take out the answers a little bit and you make them do and solve some of the problems uh, themselves by using Python or whatever language and to really show them what they need to do to, to get their, their their day job and to make it have big, have a bigger impact on what they need to do. So it kind of mot motivates people when you show them and guide them through exercises in whatever language that you're doing. Um, and that motivates them to learn the language and then they can also see how it benefits, uh, benefits them specifically. So putting together exercises uh, was a big, big one. Uh, and then also just hosting internal um, uh, education sessions uh, though those can be a little more challenging because you know some people just learn differently and they might have different paces which is totally fine and you know when you give people exercises to go do on their own time they might learn a bit however they need to learn and they come ask you questions uh, whenever they need to so it, there's pros and cons to both approaches but uh, have done both um, and I, I would say really at the end of the day just showing people how to do their work in a language, uh, and then that really motivates people uh, to to learn it even more on their own time. I love Thank that. You. May, may I ask a follow up question there? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I wanted to ask if your role was um, was defined in uh, so that you know you would be the person, say, distributing to the team uh, educational content or uh, you know, like helping them transition, or if it was something that kind of grew organically. Uh, and, and I ask this because, you know, I had the luck to join the organization that I am working today with kind of that as being part yeah. of my role. But I also see a lot of people that they do know that there are better ways, but because their role is not officially, you know, the R admin or the R educator or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a role that might need to kind of grow organically. So if you have any experience there, it could be, it could be lovely to see and yeah. how you, uh, yeah, what your advice. Great, great question. Uh, so no, <laughs> that was not technically a uh, part of my role. Uh, I like to think about and say, you have your nine to five and then this is more of your five to nine type job. Um, and some of, some of the advice I've been given over the years, something I always keep in the back of my mind is people don't always know what you can do until you show them. Uh, and they also don't know what they want until you show them. Uh, so th these, this would be an example of, of that. So we had an internal Python package uh, that was created by a group of risk managers um, and no one asked them to do that. <laughs> they just did it. And then they released it internally and it caught on like fire and everyone wanted to use it. Everyone wanted to adopt it. Uh, really started to impact everyone's roles and then that's when you that's when senior management will see the impact of that kind of work and then you could start making the case that you should spend more time professionally working on or spending some of your day job working on that as well but it takes a bit of showing for that to happen um i'm sure there are some roles out there where that's more explicit up front but you know that something that sometimes you just need to find extra time in your day. Uh, it's painful sometimes, and it's even harder now with, for me with kids. Uh, but I find that people are pretty pretty receptive um, if you show them something that benefits them. And after that, it's kind of on, on you to, to use that to your advantage to make it, make it more formal of your role there too. So no, so no it's not something that I've has ever formally asked to do or other people have asked uh, to do as well. But they see the impact eventually and they get very excited uh, as well. So um, ho hopefully that helps. It's, it's probably not the, the best answer, but that's, that's uh, again, people just don't know um, what you can do sometimes until you show them and then they see the benefit too. 
Thank you. Thank you for the awesome follow-up question. Um, Nikita, I saw you asked a question in the chat. Would you like to unmute and ask that? And if not, we can always ask it for you. Okay, I'm not, I'm not hearing or seeing. Oh, wait, I see Nikita's camera. Hello, everyone. I'm wearing there we a dark t-shirt. How do you <laughs> solutions with non-tech people? This is uh, kind of, I found an issue, especially in finance. Yeah. Everyone knows how to use Excel. And yeah. everyone knows. And we need to connect our Python with Excel. However, sharing something reproducible becomes extremely complicated. Yeah, no, that's uh, another another great question, and uh, you know, just to, maybe to be um, uh, very very explicit about that, <laughs> a very long time ago, and I think you still do it today, but you can you could hook a R into Excel directly, and that was something that I did a long long time ago, uh, but it was so cumbersome and, and painful, and it, really hard to share uh, that as well, and I think. I think I've heard more recently that Python is available in Excel now as well. Um, maybe even from the Wes McKinney interview or somewhere else, I heard him say that uh, he helped with some of that uh, as well. So maybe that's something that'll make it easier over time. Um, that being said, uh, to, me, to answer your question a little more generally, uh, I've never worked with, um, I mean, so in, in finance, there are different types of investors. Uh, there's quant quantitative portfolio managers, there's fundamental qualitative portfolio managers. Um, I myself have always worked more with the uh, more qualitative uh, um, portfolio managers uh, myself. Uh, so I've, I've never um, had the luxury, I guess, of speaking the same language uh, as, as a quantitative portfolio manager would probably speak. Uh, and I learned that quite early on in my career uh, to take the audience into account. So. You know, imagine coming from, I was in undergrad and grad school for too long, uh, almost seven years actually. So imagine coming from a quantitative background with that many years of school into a real world setting uh, and, and working on interesting quantitative projects only to present them and to find out that they have no impact <laughs> and you're communicating to an audience uh, that doesn't uh, either understand or find what you do useful. They might find it really interesting, um, but you've realized that you've spent a lot of your time working on something that's not going to have any impact. And, and typically on the risk management side, uh, they can be more of the independent team. Uh, so, you know, the portfolio managers are taking the risk and then the risk manager kind of overviewing them uh, as an independent uh, body or team uh, within the firm. And they typically have different reporting lines just to keep that separation, um, you know, pretty different uh, as well and unbiased. Um, so you can imagine that you know it's pretty disappointing. I can think of a project early on. I was doing some portfolio optimization, you know, with those black leaderman flavor to it, which is a kind of like Bayesian type style, and present that to a bunch of portfolio managers uh, where they don't optimize their portfolios in that way, um, and they don't think about quantitative techniques in that way. Um, and I was pretty disheartened uh, to find out really quickly uh, where it was not going. Uh, and for really from that moment on, I had to take a different approach in order to have impact. And really once you figure out how to have that rhythm and speak the same language with the different teams, it's even more rewarding. Uh, and one way though, I, I still, you know, maybe, maybe a secret in a secretive way is behind the scenes, I'm still doing quantitative work. But when I'm presenting and talking to portfolio managers, I'm going to leave out a lot of those details and to only mostly focus on the business impact and business value and tailor in a way that speaks the same language uh, as them uh, as much as possible. So for example, I'll give a quick example. One of, one of my more interesting analyses is, it sounds really simple, but it's similar to optimization, but it's random portfolio weight. So you can just generate a bunch of random numbers and allocate uh, different, uh, you know, investments to those weights and to see a bunch of different outcomes for different portfolios. And you can kind of use that, you know, scatter plot of uh, outcomes and compare how you're doing 
uh, versus a bunch of random portfolios, kind of like monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard uh, or typing on a typewriter to see if they can write out Shakespeare in a way. And are you better better than them uh, or not? Are you just uh, are you really far off base from a bunch of random uh, numbers, or are you actually pretty competitive? Um, but when I present something like that, I'm not going to talk about how I actually generated uh, those numbers, and th that can be a pretty technical uh, way as well, because um, you know te technically what you're trying to do there is not. You might think it's really easy to do that because you might just want to. Uh, generate random uh, uniform numbers, but actually, if you look at the scatter plot of those results, you'll see that they have different clusters. Uh, so if you visualize uh, that, they have different clusters uh, as well. So you have to do something technically much more mathy uh, than that. So it's really tempting to just generate uniform random numbers, but really you have to generate more like exponential type just, uh, distribution in terms of numbers to normalize. Uh, and then you can think about what happens if I move forward through time and how do you have turnover and, and things like that? So it can get pretty interesting quantitatively, uh, but I'm never going to want to talk about that level of detail uh, with a portfolio manager. I'm going to focus on, okay, I'm just going to generate some numbers, show you the results, and we're going to start having some conversations. And then, you know, if they do have questions, I can answer them. Uh, but it's really about bridging the gap uh, between how they take the risk. You're kind of in the middle, and then you have on the other side, either the models you're using or the models in the system and the quants uh, that are developing them. So you're kind of you have to speak both languages is, is maybe one way to think about it, understanding the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Reading through the chat right now, it feels like there's some sort of follow up that we all would like to see on like an Excel and R and Python collaboration or just helpful packages. So Libby, maybe that's something we could look at after as we go through the chat. Yeah, we need some resources. You guys yeah. didn't so much in there. <laughs> um, but Jason, I, I know you you just touched on this on working with the portfolio managers, but when you and I were were chatting a bit before, we talked about like how do you actually convince the portfolio managers to listen to you? And I thought it might be good to reiterate that because just as we all think about communicating with stakeholders. Sure. Um so that, that's a, so definitely a, a big one. Uh, I, I think it goes back to maybe listening to them uh, first um, and, and not come out uh, of, of the gates uh, too fast in terms of uh, what you're thinking and uh, viewing from your independent uh, risk perspective. I think it's really important to understand uh, their style, their views, and then to also think about what the client wants and what the in or in stakeholder wants uh, for whatever product you might be working on. Um, so you kind of want to have a big picture of the different areas of um, really who's making the decisions from the portfolio side and who's being impacted um, you know, with the results on the end user side as well. And once you have that, you kind of really understood how everything works together you know, you want to be able to speak the same language. It goes back to a similar question that just got asked. You know, you want to be able to speak uh, the same language. And once you're able to do that, I, I think they'll start listening uh, more, more to you. And, uh, you know, one unfortunate thing is it just this takes time. <laughs> so, you know, the portfolio manager and other people, they need to trust you. And you might be the smartest, most brilliant, quantitative person in the world. But if no one's listening to you, even though you're right, uh, that's not a good outcome. And you want to be able for people to listen to you. And I, I think with that, time is the biggest factor. And then when you do have some time under your belt, you're able to communicate and to um, talk in the same way and to have similar impacts to what a portfolio manager um, might be thinking, might be thinking uh, there as well. So I think it's a bit of speaking the same language over time and understanding um, essentially what, and also what the end user client is expecting as well. And if you can frame questions and points in that way and make it, you know, frame it in a way where it's really about the client and really about the end user, um, I think you could maybe speed up a little bit more and to really have that uh, conversation earlier on as well. I think everyone is wants to do the right thing at the end of the day. and. 
if you can frame it in that way, then uh, you might get some earlier adoption as well too there. Thank you. And we will be sure to try to harvest some of these that we're seeing in the chat and put them somewhere later. Um, Alan, you had a great question. Would you like to ask that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, Jason, I got really curious, and I think you spoke to this a little bit in speaking to the Q's question about like quantitative versus qualitative um, and how, how you, it got me thinking about all of the inputs that must go into the work that you do. And I'm really curious about like the back end data ecosystem of stuff like there's got to be lots and lots of quantitative stuff and then there must be a lot of things that are kind of speculative like what happens if like different kinds of scenarios and stuff like that i'm really curious how all that kind of information gets generated and managed and and if that causes problems for like reproducibility or cross validation or um or things like that like what what happens with that kind of information and how do you turn that into, you know, this, the, how does that come into the story that you tell? Um, uh, there, there's a whole bunch there, like it, it, take that in any way that, that is like an interesting path. Like how, how do you, how do you get the right data for things that seem really hard to quantify? Maybe that's the, maybe that's the fundamental thing. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've worked on a number of projects over the years that required crunching a lot of data. And one of the that's also one of the reasons why I felt the need to create the role package in R. It's available on CRAN for everyone on this call to go download afterwards. Um, and you know, what it, because at the end of the day, I wanted to calculate basic statistics like Z scores. And I wanted to have some sort of weighting scheme attached uh, to it. And I wanted, and I had missing data. Um, and you know, if you wanted to just roll apply or roll some other function um, in R, you're rolling some function that, you know, is, is you're kind of tied to how that function uh, behaves. It might accept weights, it might accept missing values, maybe not both, or maybe one or the other. So you're kind of at the mercy of uh, that function. And I wanted something that could support those uh, features. And I wanted to be able to do that fast because I, I didn't really know the right uh, window size or the weighting scheme. Uh, so I needed to be able to iterate quickly and create you know, some sort of shiny app is what I did uh, there too. And you could toggle between those parameters uh, very quickly to get a sense of um, the different uh, Z scores of the data uh, yourself there too. So you know, that, that would be something that, that really motivated me to create that package. But to really answer your question with a more tangible example, um, you know, there are a bunch of concepts uh, in finance that aren't really taught in textbooks. Um, and, you know, one, one, one big project uh, that I've worked on and it's public information, uh, it's been published uh, externally before, uh, is some work on crowded trades. And that's something that is a very easy concept to explain. And, but it's a really difficult concept uh, to quantify. Uh, so you can, everyone, probably can uh, figure out what that means uh, just by the word crowded trades, but it's when a lot of people are in the same uh, trade or investment and you want to know that. And especially from a risk perspective, that's very important uh, because uh, you don't want to be the last person standing when everyone has left the room uh, and you can have a pretty significant drawdown and lose a lot of money. So we want to be able to sh uh, make sure that we can at least track that quantitatively, have some conversations about that. but. You know, how do you quantify something like that that's not a textbook? Um, and that's really where it goes to talking to people about their experience in those types of situations. And, you know, especially if you're starting out in finance or something else, some other domain, uh, if you don't know something, uh, it's definitely useful to go talk to people that have experienced uh, those situations and say, hi, hey, uh, you know, in these types of scenarios, what have you noticed uh, in the data or what data would you use? Uh, what, have, what has your experience been in these situations? And then you start to see where people are thinking and where their minds are going when you ask those questions. So I was able to identify the different data sources that really explained uh, some of the behavior you would see in, in the market. And then, you know, talking is one thing, but then going and find the data is another thing. And you have to go 
talk to either data vendors or come up with the data uh, yourself, uh, but you get probably better insights if you can find data that's uh, maybe more proprietary or something that you've developed uh, yourself. I've been, I like to go to a lot of uh, finance conferences and I've heard some really smart uh, asset managers talk about, quantitative asset managers talk about how they like to hire PhD level people to do basic regression and data cleaning. Mm -hmm. And the question is why would they want to spend their time on that? And really though, that's, that's the hardest part is some of the more basic work. And if you can find somebody with a PhD mentality who can get their hands dirty, wants to get their hands really dirty with data cleaning and linear regressions, then uh, that's that's even better in a way. Um, and so I had to find data that would suit um, you know, the question I'm trying to answer. And I got that from talking to different people, trying to find the right data sources, and then you know, putting thing, everything together in an aggregation of some way and some sort of dashboard of sorts. Um, and you know, one thing at the end of the day though is uh, it's you can send out just a spreadsheet of numbers or a PDF of numbers or a shiny with just a grid on it. But really what's impactful is when you can tell the story with the data and to kind of not really tell people how to think, but really what to focus on and they can draw their own conclusions. Uh, and that's also a big challenge because you, you, I mean, some people will read data and they'll draw their own conclusions or it's really obvious just to regurgitate the numbers on the page. But if you can find how different data points tell a bigger, better story, uh, that's when some people are, are, start to listen to you even more, and you realize they realize that you have more insights to say than what's just shown on the paper, and you can really connect the dots. Uh, and so, doing some sort of write-up analysis of what you're seeing uh, really leads to a lot of adoption of uh, projects there too, from a quantitative framework and quantifying things that aren't uh, normally quantified in a way there too. So hopefully that answers your question uh, on that topic. Yeah, it does, thanks. It's, it's really neat to think about many, many of those inputs into something like a model being their research projects and you're finding data, you're defining, you're coding. Um, yeah, it's neat to hear. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I wanna make sure I cover some of the Slido questions. Um, and somebody had asked, can you give advice on how to work across teams that have poor working relationships? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good one. That, that's always, that's an unavoidable um, situation uh, there too. So it definitely depends on um, the different types of different types of teams and the different types of people on those teams. Um, and you know, it, in the different domains, you can have different types of personalities, and um, you know, it, it really goes to um, how you can kind of navigate uh, that domain is pretty challenging. Um, so, you know, one one thing that I've noticed over the years is I, I like to be just as passionate about my work as maybe other people would do their job. So if you can try to be more partner-like uh, with them and to really show them, try to put yourselves in, in their shoes is, is another way, I guess, of, of thinking about it. So if you think about, okay, if, if I was some person who just got this email request from this person, this other team, you know, what does it mean? Uh, why should I care about it? Um, and they might have a pretty negative response to you off the bat, but if you can kind of put yourselves into their shoes, maybe you could reframe that email or that ask um, in a way to really uh, get a better outcome. And that's something that is challenging to do, to think about it from the other person's perspective, but that's something that I find uh, works uh, pretty well too. So it's it's unavoidable for conflicts, um, but really to understand um, where it is uh, that they're coming from. And, and you can kind of draw parallels in a way to, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna open up a whole can of worms here, but you know, open source development, uh, you know, you can get, I think of it like anybody today or tomorrow can go open up an issue request on my GitHub uh, and write whatever they want on it. And maybe it makes me feel great or maybe it doesn't. Uh, you know, I, I really shouldn't try, try to take it personally. Anyone can do what they want, but trying to take it, then take a step back and to really think about it from their uh, perspective and maybe reframing the question in a way that's, uh, Better and maybe leads to a better outcome. 
uh, would be a better scenario for everyone. And, and I, I've said this a few times, but maybe even reframing it into a way of they're asking a question and they you, you could be getting a better outcome if they've asked a different, slightly different question. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that leads to a better outcome for everyone. And then maybe even you are motivated uh, to tackle the problem, even though it came off a very negative uh, at the beginning uh, there too. So um, I, I like to think of it, I guess, from a, a different person's perspective and they can ask anything at any time uh, and you, you want to keep an open mind and maybe just take a, take a deep breath, take a step back and to think about how can you solve the problem more generally than maybe what they're asking in a very narrow sense uh, at the same time too. Thank you. I think that we had a good question from Neil, but it's got asterisk, so I will ask it. And it was, what do you think is the next big thing in relation to coding? So the next kind of innovation in coding when it comes to risk management, or is there anything that you're excited about? Yeah, um, I'll take that. Uh, I was I was I was expecting a question around uh, LLMs, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll take that question to be a secret question around LLMs in a way. Um, I, I use, uh, I, I personally pay for uh, Copilot um, and I find it very useful uh, for my coding uh, to get things done quicker, um, both in a number of ways. Uh, one is I might do something one off very sloppily. And when I have time, I'll go back and want to do a faster, better job, more efficient job, and it can help me solve that problem, uh, maybe reformat my code, my function entirely. Um, you know, that's been pretty useful from that perspective, but of, of course, have to double, triple check everything that comes out of it. Um, and then, you know, more recently, what I've been doing is almost, uh, it's, it's a little um, cumbersome in a way, tedious, uh, but almost going function by function uh, in my package uh, and essentially doing like a code review uh, of sorts and to really make sure that um, I'm doing things efficiently. I could have done something differently. And if the suggestion is A and I, I'm going to review it, I'll take it serious for a little bit. Uh, but if it makes sense or doesn't make sense, I'll just um, move, move on from there. So maybe not, I wouldn't take everything uh, so seriously from from the output output perspective, but it's definitely interesting to see some of the suggestions sometime and to make you question uh, what what you've done. Um, and you know, so it's from a coding perspective, I find it useful for one one realm of of a code review that I can easily just do myself um, there too. I I do think it's uh, one interview question. That was, so when I do some interviews and ask people questions, I am always refreshed when some people say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, that also means people are being honest and you, they want you to trust them and you, you appreciate that from a risk perspective. Uh, I have not come across the case yet where ChatGPT says, I don't know, uh, especially with asking coding questions. So it's, it's a very confident uh, system at the moment. It would be a little more trustworthy if it could, uh, you know, see, I don't know sometimes that would be pretty useful. So I would take everything from it uh, with a grain of salt, but I've, I found it useful um, from a coding review perspective. Uh, and it's also, I've also enjoyed going through the, the API uh, from, uh, from OpenAI as well as some of the others, uh, just to see the, the workflow there. Um, and it, it helps you understand the process uh, and it's it's interesting to see the different steps um, from end to end, to end uh, there too. So in terms of similarity and calculating distances, and, and, and it can be that kind of just that kind of exercise is pretty interesting. Just to think about how certain events are um, in, are relevant or not, and uh, I, I definitely think there's maybe some adoption in the risk management space there. Um, in terms of thinking about different regimes or different types of similar environments uh, that you're in. So is today's environment, you can quantitatively do some of that today uh, using big macro data, but can you use something more sophisticated um, like a LLM type model or some other model um, to figure out the regime you're in and to 
think about the different types of outcomes and scenarios and to just create a better toolbox uh, from a quantitative perspective. I want to make sure we take a few minutes to touch on the community side of things. And I know you've been involved in the R and finance community for some time, and that's where you mentioned you first heard about our studio, I think. Um, could you share a little bit about how you think your involvement in community has impacted your career? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think um, it's interesting. I went to our finance physically for the first time in 2015. Um, and I was, I would always read the presentations online for the years before then. And I was always so impressed uh, with the quality and the content. Uh, and I was very lucky and enjoyed uh, going there uh, in person. And that motivated me to um, submit a talk for the next year. Uh, and it was really, um, I, I found I got a lot of value out of going there physically and meeting the people behind the packages uh, that I'd use on a day-to-day -day basis. It really, it's really interesting and it's useful to meet them and to hear their thinking, um, especially things that are not post online and you get to learn about what they're thinking or what they're doing. Maybe they just don't have time uh, to do what they want yet. So just, I, I learned a lot just from going to conferences and then having some confidence to present uh, the following year and to get some feedback from everyone out of it was very uh, useful. So, you know, I definitely got some uh, feedback uh, after my a couple of my presentations about different uh, approaches to what I'm doing to make it even faster. Uh, so, you know, I was able to benefit uh, from that feedback and make um, the package uh, even faster over the years. Uh, it's not, I'm not going to say it was easy, quick uh, thing to do, but uh, it got done eventually, um, and it was had a lot of impact. So, but, so I appreciate that advice. It just, you know, I have limited time nights and weekends to contribute to that work. So it's one of those passion projects where you know what you want to do. It's just finding the time sometimes to do it can be quite challenging. But so the feedback was quite uh, impactful, and you know. Hadley at one point opened up a couple issues on my GitHub to request some some functions a long time ago. So uh, just getting that uh, it was uh, quite uh, exciting to see and to uh, you know work on uh, for a little bit. Um, and then also more recently, you know some of the data table folks um, seems like that package has gotten uh, re-energized uh, significantly over the last year or so uh, with some more funding. Uh, so they're doing a lot of a lot of work. Uh, in that uh, space, and they're presenting at a lot of conferences, and they're it's a very optimal, optimized package to do a lot of things. Uh, so I'm a big user of that, and I've been lucky to they they do have a rolling uh, function now, uh, F roll, um, and so I've been I do talk to the developer on the data ta data table team uh, who's working on that, and we share you know lessons learned about different approaches and. Uh, learn from each other uh, that way. So it's been exciting to talk to somebody who uh, he doesn't live, he doesn't go to the R and finance conferences. So I don't know if I'll ever meet him in person, but it's been um, nice to to see and to read and talk to him uh, over the years about what what he's thinking. And I'm always always impressed with that package. Uh, I, you know, mine mine is pretty fast, uh, and theirs is going to be a little bit faster. <laughs> uh, so they're they're very. Uh, Amazing bunch of folks who are working on that package. So I've, I've definitely learned a lot, even though um, you know maybe they might be a little bit faster. I, I still learned a lot uh, from them, and I think that's something that is important for everyone to do and just to keep learning. And you know, I started with R back in 2009, and then I switched uh, to Python, and now who knows uh, what's next? And with all the LLMs and and everything uh, there too. It's uh, kind of an un un unanswered question at the moment. So excited to see um, what, what's next uh, there too. So we'll see. But it definitely continuous learning is something that I enjoy doing and keeps you um, uh, engaged on uh, what's coming up next. So it's it's something I recommend for everyone. And going to conferences, presenting, even posting what is useful for you would be interesting to see. Um, uh, something, maybe not even something that's relevant for your professional life, but even personal life um, would be interesting to see, like something that's actually useful uh, for you is something that uh, would be useful for others to hear and share about and to learn from as well. 
Absolutely. I know when we were talking, you mentioned wanting to get the finance community together more regularly and maybe putting a call out to people who are on the hangout. Yeah, as well. yeah. But I, I was just curious, what were you what were you thinking of? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, I, I think it's if, if anyone wants to catch up or talk afterwards about ideas about uh, finance and, you know, I'm working, uh, you know, one of one thing that I one of the reasons why, um, you know, I, I took on a new role last year was I wanted to um, think about different types of uh, asset classes with even less data than I'm used to. So it's very each deal is very bespoke. Uh, so I wanted to take on a challenge where data might be more challenging to find. And in the finance world, um, you can get a lot of data for other types of asset classes, but for some, it's really hard to get. So if anybody you know w wants to talk, bounce ideas about how and their experiences uh, with data in that kind of space, I'm very interested to learn uh, from, from other people. So um, definitely something that I'd like to follow up with anybody on uh, afterwards is just uh, what, what people's experiences have been in our Python data science in, in the finance world. And you can get specific enough to uh, on the more esoteric type of <clears throat> asset classes that would benefit me, that would be very useful uh, to learn about. And if people you know, use the role package, I'm always interested in their um, applications and use cases there as well, and happy to you know, hear feedback um, there as well. So, uh, and, and so anyone that's uh, interested or wants the, uh, in the finance world would definitely be uh, useful to hear from you. Great, thank you. I know we're down to the last minute. This is maybe a hard question to fit into a minute. So I'll just ask it real quick. Um, but Ibrahim asks, how would someone with less experience stand out in this time of a crazy job market? If a large project is the way, what are some ideas for such? Well, that's a great question. Um, I I remember getting stacks of resumes and uh, going through them. And after a while, a lot of them look very similar. So it is very, very hard, but rest assured, some real people are actually looking at them. Um, and, you know, I, I but that being said, you know, step one is really just to have the qualifications from a quantitative perspective. So something quantitative is always useful. Uh, that's kind of like a starting point. Uh, and then I personally like to see some sort of passion or motivation for, for the role. Uh, and then you have to think about what is something that would make you stand out. And, you know, it, it goes to what one, one maybe easier thing to think about is what is something that's typically actually challenging for a quantitative person to think about. And, really one thing that is maybe more of the soft qualitative skills. Um, so you can think about what's something that they've done in that space, whether they're really following the markets um, and they can, can they really explain what's going on in the markets and talk about the markets that can be challenging uh, for some people just to keep up with the news and to explain it in a way that's, uh, you know, it's got an interesting uh, story to it and can tell a uh, perspective that you might have or doing something like presentations or Toastmaster or something along those lines uh, would also stand out in a way that would separate you from the quantitative universe of resumes in a way, because everyone's gonna look the same from a quant perspective. You want something that's maybe not uh, so, so quantitative to really stand out there too. Thank you so much, Jason, for joining us today and sharing your experience. I know we're a minute over here, but I really, Really enjoy the conversation today and can't wait to go back and look through the chat as well. And Libby and I will try and gather some of those resources shared there and we'll start getting a little more creative about the way we're gonna share these as follow-ups with the recording too. Great, yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks everybody. And Jason, I know we'll see you back out here as an attendee as well. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> but I, I'll be I'm next I shared your LinkedIn in the chat if people want to connect, but I also just started a thread um, if I could help connect people on the finance topic as well. Feel okay, free to great. Thank you. Okay. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks.